Chapter 66 of Romola. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Goldfarb. Romola by George Eliot. Chapter 66 A Mask of the Furies. The next day was Palm Sunday, or Olive Sunday, as it was chiefly called in the olive-growing Valdarno, and the morning sun shone with a more delicious clearness for the yesterday's rain. Once more Savonarola mounted the pulpit in San Marco, and saw a flock around him whose faith in him was still unshaken, and this morning, in calm and sad sincerity, he declared himself ready to die. In front of all visions he saw his own doom. Once more he uttered the benediction, and saw the faces of men and women lifted towards him in venerating love. Then he descended the steps of the pulpit, and turned away from that sight for ever. For before the sun had set, Florence was in an uproar. The passions which had been roused the day before had been smouldering through that quiet morning, and had now burst out again, with a fury not unassisted by design, and not without official connivance. The uproar had begun at the Duomo in an attempt of some Compagnacci to hinder the evening sermon, which the Pignoni had assembled to hear. But no sooner had men's blood mounted and the disturbances had become an affray, than the cry arose, To San Marco! The fire to San Marco! And long before the daylight had died, both the church and convent were being besieged by an enraged and continually increasing multitude, not without resistance, for the monks, long conscious of growing hostility without, had arms within their walls, and some of them fought as vigorously in their long white tunics as if they had been knights templars. Even the command of Savonarola could not prevail against the impulse to self-defense in arms that were still muscular under the Dominican Serge. There were laymen, too, who had not chosen to depart, and some of them fought fiercely, there was firing from the high altar close by the great crucifix, there was pouring of stones and hot embers from the convent roof, there was close fighting with swords in the cloisters. Notwithstanding the force of the assailants, the attack lasted till deep night. The demonstrations of the government had all been against the convent. Early in the attack, guards had been sent for, not to disperse the assailants, but to command all within the convent to lay down their arms, all laymen to depart from it, and Savonarola himself to quit the Florentine territory within twelve hours. Had Savonarola quitted the convent then, he could hardly have escaped being torn to pieces. He was willing to go, but his friends hindered him. It was felt to be a great risk even for some layman of high name to depart by the garden wall, but among those who had chosen to do so was Francesco Valori, who hoped to raise rescue from without. And now, when it was deep night, when the struggle could hardly have lasted much longer, and the Compagnacci might soon have carried their swords into the library, where Savonarola was praying, with the brethren who had either not taken up arms, or had laid them down at his command, there came a second body of guards, commissioned by the Signoria, to demand the persons of Fra Girolamo and his two coadjutors, Fra Domenico and Fra Salvestro. Loud was the roar of triumphant hate, when the light of lanterns showed the frate issuing from the door of the convent, with a guard who promised him no other safety than that of the prison. The struggle now was, who should get first in the stream that rushed up the narrow street to see the prophet carried back in ignominy to the piazza where he had braved it yesterday? Who should be in the best place for reaching his ear with insult, nay, if possible, for smiting him and kicking him? This was not difficult for some of the armed compagnacci, who were not prevented from mixing themselves with the guards. When Savonarola felt himself dragged and pushed along in the midst of that hooting multitude, when lanterns were lifted to show him deriding faces, when he felt himself spit upon, smitten and kicked with grossest words of insult, it seemed to him that the worst bitterness of life was past. If men judged him guilty and were bent on having his blood, it was only death that awaited him. But the worst drop of bitterness can never be wrung unto our lips from without. The lowest depth of resignation is not to be found in martyrdom. It is only to be found when we have covered our heads in silence and felt, I am not worthy to be a martyr. The truth shall prosper, but not by me. But that brief imperfect triumph of insulting the frate, who had soon disappeared under the doorway of the old palace, was only like the taste of blood to the tiger. 
Were there not the houses of the hypocrite's friends to be sacked? Already one half of the armed multitude, too much in the rear to share greatly in the siege of the convent, had been employed in the more profitable work of attacking rich houses, not with planless desire for plunder, but with that discriminating selection of such as belonged to Chief Piagnoni, which showed that the riot was under guidance, and that the rabble with clubs and staves was well officered by sword-girt compagnacci. Was there not, next criminal after the frate, the ambitious Francesco Valori, suspected of wanting, with the frate's help, to make himself a doge or gonfalonier for life, and the grey-haired man who, eight months ago, had lifted his arm and his voice in such ferocious demand for justice on five of his fellow-citizens, only escaped from San Marco to experience what others called justice, to see his house surrounded by an angry, greedy multitude, to see his wife shot dead with an arrow, and to be himself murdered as he was on his way to answer a summons to the palazzo by the swords of men named Ridolfi and Tornabuoni. In this way that mask of the Furies, called Riot, was played on in Florence through the hours of night and early morning. But the chief director was not visible. He had his reasons for issuing his orders from a private retreat, being of rather too high a name to let his red feather be seen waving amongst all the work that was to be done before the dawn. The retreat was the same house and the same room in a quiet street between Santa Croce and San Marco, where we have seen Tito paying a secret visit to Dolfo Spini. Here the captain of the Compagnacci sat through this memorable night, receiving visitors who came and went and went and came, some of them in the guise of armed Compagnacci, others dressed obscurely and without visible arms. There was abundant wine on the table, with drinking cups for chance comers, and though Spini was on his guard against excessive drinking, he took enough from time to time to heighten the excitement produced by the news that was being brought to him continually. Among the obscurely dressed visitors, Ser Ciaccone was one of the most frequent, and as the hours advanced towards the morning twilight, he had remained as Spini's constant companion, together with Francesco K., who was then in rather careless hiding in Florence, expecting to have his banishment revoked when the frate's fall had been accomplished. The tapers had burned themselves into low, shapeless masses, and holes in the shutters were just marked by a sombre outward light, when Spini, who had started from his seat and walked up and down with an angry flush on his face at some talk that had been going forward with those two unmilitary companions, burst out, "'The devil spit him! He shall pay for it, though! Ha! <laughs> ha! The claws shall be down on him when he little thinks of them!' So he was to be the great man after all. He's been pretending to chuck everything towards my cap as if I were a blind beggarman, and all the while he's been winking and filling his own scarcella. I should like to hang skins about him and set my hounds on him. And he's got that fine ruby of mine I was fool enough to give him yesterday. Malediction! And he was laughing at me in his sleeve two years ago and spoiling the best plan that ever was laid. I was a fool for trusting myself with a rascal who had long twisted contrivances that nobody could see to the end of but himself. A Greek, too, who dropped into Florence with gems packed about him, said Francesco K., who had a slight smile of amusement on his face at Spini's fuming. You did not choose your confidant very wisely, my Dolfo. He's a cursed deal cleverer than you, Francesco, and handsomer, too said Spini, turning on his associate with a general desire to worry anything that presented itself. "'I humbly conceive,' said Ser Ciaccone, "'that Messer Francesco's poetic genius will outweigh. "'Yes, yes, rub your hands. "'I hate that notary's trick of yours,' interrupted Spini, "'whose patronage consisted largely in this sort of frankness. "'Oh, but there comes Tadeo, or somebody. "'Now's the time. What news, eh?' he went on as two compagnacci entered with heated looks bad said one the people have made up their minds they were going to have the sacking of soderini's house and now they have been balked we shall have them turning on us if we don't take care i suspect there are some mediceans buzzing about among them and we may see them attacking your palace over the bridge before long unless we can find a bait for them another way i have it said Spini, and seizing Taddeo by the belt, he drew him aside to give him directions, while the other went on telling Kay how the Signoria had interfered about Soderini's house. Ecco! exclaimed Spini presently, giving Taddeo a slight push towards the door. 
Go and make quick work. End of chapter 66「Chapter sixty seven of Romola. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Goldfarb. Romola by George Eliot. Chapter sixty seven. Waiting by the River. About the time when the two Compagnacci went on their errand, there was another man who, on the opposite side of the Arno, was also going out into the chill grey twilight. His errand apparently could have no relation to theirs. He was making his way to the brink of the river at a spot which, though within the city walls, was overlooked by no dwellings, and which only seemed the more shrouded and lonely for the warehouses and granaries which at some little distance backward turned their shoulders to the river. There was a sloping width of long grass and rushes, made all the more dank by broad gutters, which here and there emptied themselves into the Arno. The gutters and the loneliness were the attraction that drew this man to come and sit down among the grass, and bend over the waters that ran swiftly in the channelled slope at his side, for he had once had a large piece of bread brought to him by one of those friendly runlets, and more than once a raw carrot and apple parings. It was worth while to wait for such chances in a place where there was no one to see, and often in his restless wakefulness he came to watch here before daybreak. It might save him for one day the need of that silent begging, which consisted in sitting on a church step by the wayside out beyond the Porta San Frediano. For Baldassare hated begging so much that he would perhaps have chosen to die rather than make even that silent appeal, but for one reason that made him desire to live. It was no longer a hope. It was only that possibility which clings to every idea that has taken complete possession of the mind, the sort of possibility that makes a woman watch on a headland for the ship which held something dear, though all her neighbors are certain that the ship was a wreck long years ago. After he had come out of the convent hospital, where the monks of San Miniato had taken care of him as long as he was helpless, after he had watched in vain for the wife who was to help him, and had begun to think that she was dead of the pestilence that seemed to fill all the space since the night he parted from her, he had been unable to conceive any way in which sacred vengeance could satisfy itself through his arm. His knife was gone, and he was too feeble in body to win another by work, too feeble in mind, even if he had had the knife, to contrive that it should serve its one purpose. He was a shattered, bewildered, lonely old man. Yet he desired to live. He waited for something of which he had no distinct vision, something dim, formless, that startled him and made strong pulsations within him, like that unknown thing which we look for when we start from sleep, though no voice or touch has waked us. Baldassare desired to live, and therefore he crept out in the grey light and seated himself in the long grass and watched the waters that had a faint promise in them. Meanwhile the Compagnacci were busy at their work. The formidable bands of armed men, left to do their will with very little interference from an embarrassed, if not conniving, signoria, had parted into two masses, but both were soon making their way by different roads towards the Arno. The smaller mass was making for the Ponte Rubaconte, the larger for the Ponte Vecchio, but in both the same words had passed from mouth to mouth as a signal, and almost every man of the multitude knew that he was going to the Via de Bardi to sack a house there. If he knew no other reason, could he demand a better? The armed Compagnacci knew something more, for a brief word of command flies quickly, and the leaders of the two streams of rabble had a perfect understanding that they would meet before a certain house a little towards the eastern end of the Via de Bardi, where the master would probably be in bed and be surprised in his morning sleep. But the master of that house was neither sleeping nor in bed. He had not been in bed that night for Tito's anxiety to quit Florence had been stimulated by the events of the previous day. Investigations would follow, in which appeals might be made to him delaying his departure, and in all delay he had an uneasy sense that there was danger. Falsehood had prospered and waxed strong, but it had nourished the twin life, fear. He no longer wore his armor, he was no longer afraid of Baldassare. But from the corpse of that dead fear a spirit had risen, the undying habit of fear. 
he felt he should not be safe till he was out of this fierce, turbid Florence, and now he was ready to go. Maso was to deliver up his house to the new tenant. His horses and mules were awaiting him in San Gallo. Tessa and the children had been lodged for the night in the Borgo outside the gate, and would be dressed in readiness to mount the mules and join him. He descended the stone steps into the courtyard. He passed through the great doorway, not the same Tito, but nearly as brilliant as on the day when he had first entered that house and made the mistake of falling in love with Romola. The mistake was remedied now. The old life was cast off and was soon to be far behind him. He turned with rapid steps towards the Piazza dei Mozzi, intending to pass over the Ponte Rubaconte. But as he went along, certain sounds came upon his ears that made him turn round and walk yet more quickly in the opposite direction. Was the mob coming into Oltrano? It was a vexation, for he would have preferred the more private road. He must now go by the Ponte Vecchio, and unpleasant sensations made him draw his mantle close round him and walk at his utmost speed. There was no one to see him in that grey twilight, but before he reached the end of the Via de Bardi, like sounds fell on his ear again, and this time they were much louder and nearer. Could he have been deceived before? The mob must be coming over the Ponte Vecchio. Again he turned, from an impulse of fear that was stronger than reflection, but it was only to be assured that the mob was actually entering the street from the opposite end. He chose not to go back to his house. After all, they would not attack him. Still, he had some valuables about him, and all things except reason and order are possible with a mob. But necessity does the work of courage. He went on towards the Ponte Vecchio, the rush and the trampling and the confused voices getting so loud before him that he had ceased to hear them behind. For he had reached the end of the street, and the crowd pouring from the bridge met him at the turning and hemmed in his way. He had not time to wonder at a sudden shout before he felt himself surrounded, not in the first instance by an unarmed rabble, but by armed compagnacci. The next sensation was that his cap fell off, and that he was thrust violently forward amongst the rabble along the narrow passage of the bridge. Then he distinguished the shouts. Piagnone! Medicean! Piagnone! Throw him over the bridge! His mantle was being torn off him with strong poles that would have throttled him if the fibula had not given way. Then his scarcella was snatched at, but all the while he was being hustled and dragged, and the snatch failed, his scarcella still hung at his side. Shouting, yelling, half-motiveless execration rang stunningly in his ears, spreading even amongst those who had not yet seen him, and only knew there was a man to be reviled. Tito's horrible dread was that he should be struck down or trampled on before he reached the open arches that surmount the centre of the bridge. There was one hope for him, that they might throw him over before they had wounded him or beaten the strength out of him, and his whole soul was absorbed in that one hope and its obverse terror. Yes, they were at the arches. In that moment Tito, with bloodless face and eyes dilated, had one of the self-preserving inspirations that come in extremity. With a sudden desperate effort he mastered the clasp of his belt, and flung belt and scarcella forward towards a yard of clear space against the parapet, crying in a ringing voice, "'There are diamonds! There is gold!' In the instant the hold on him was relaxed, and there was a rush towards the scarcella. He threw himself on the parapet with a desperate leap, and in the next moment plunged, plunged with a great plash into the dark river far below. It was his chance of salvation and it was a good chance. His life had been saved once before by his fine swimming, and as he rose to the surface again after his long dive, he had a sense of deliverance. He struck out with all the energy of his strong prime, and the current helped him. If he could only swim beyond the Ponte alla Carrara, he might land in a remote part of the city, and even yet reach San Gallo. Life was still before him, and the idiot mob, shouting and bellowing on the bridge there, would think he was drowned. They did think so. Peering over the parapet along the dark stream, they could not see afar off the moving blackness of the floating hair on the velvet tunic sleeves. It was only from the other way that a pale olive face could be seen looking white above the dark water, a face not easy even for the indifferent to forget, with its square forehead, the long low arch of the eyebrows, and the long lustrous agate-like eyes. Onward the face went on the dark current, with inflated, quivering nostrils, with the blue veins distended on the temples. One bridge was passed, the bridge of Santa Trinita, 
Should he risk landing now, rather than trust to his strength? No. He heard, or fancied he heard, yells and cries pursuing him. Terror pressed him most from the side of his fellow men. He was less afraid of indefinite chances, and he swam on, panting and straining. He was not so fresh as he would have been if he had passed the night in sleep. Yet the next bridge, the last bridge, was passed. He was conscious of it, but in the tumult of his blood he could only feel vaguely that he was safe and might land. But where? The current was having its way with him. He hardly knew where he was. Exhaustion was bringing on the dreamy state that precedes unconsciousness. But now there were eyes that discerned him, aged eyes, strong for the distance. Baldassare, looking up blankly from the search in the runlet that brought him nothing, had seen a white object coming along the broader stream. Could that be any fortunate chance for him? He looked and looked till the object gathered form. Then he leaned forward with a start as he sat among the rank green stems, and his eyes seemed to be filled with a new light. Yet he only watched, motionless. Something was being brought to him. The next instant a man's body was cast violently on the grass two yards from him, and he started forward like a panther, clutching the velvet tunic as he fell forward on the body and flashed a look in the man's face. Dead. Was he dead? The eyes were rigid. But no, it could not be. Justice had brought him. Men looked dead sometimes, and yet the life came back into them. Baldassare did not feel feeble in that moment. He knew just what he could do. He got his large fingers within the neck of the tunic and held them there, kneeling on one knee beside the body and watching the face. There was a fierce hope in his heart, but it was mixed with trembling. In his eyes there was only fierceness. All the slow-burning remnant of life within him seemed to have leaped into flame. Rigid, rigid still, those eyes with the half-fallen lids were locked against vengeance. Could it be that he was dead? There was nothing to measure the time. It seemed long enough for hope to freeze into despair. Surely at last the eyelids were quivering, the eyes were no longer rigid. There was a vibrating light in them. They opened wide. Ah, yes, you see me. You know me. Tito knew him, but he did not know whether it was life or death that had brought him into the presence of his injured father. It might be death, and death might mean this chill gloom with the face of the hideous past hanging over him for ever. But now Baldassare's only dread was, lest the young limbs should escape him. He pressed his knuckles against the round throat and knelt upon the chest with all the force of his aged frame. Let death come now. Again he kept his watch on the face, and when the eyes were rigid again, he dared not trust them. He would never lose his hold till some one came and found them. Justice would send some witness, and then he, Baldassare, would declare that he had killed this traitor to whom he had once been a father. They would perhaps believe him now, and then he would be content with the struggle of justice on earth. Then he would desire to die with his hold on this body, and follow the traitor to hell that he might clutch him there. And so he knelt, and so he pressed his knuckles against the round throat, without trusting to the seeming death, till the light got strong and he could kneel no longer. Then he sat on the body, still clutching the neck of the tunic. But the hours went on, and no witness came. No eyes descried afar off the two human bodies among the tall grass by the riverside. Florence was busy with greater affairs on the preparation of a deeper tragedy. Not long after those two bodies were lying on the grass, Savonarola was being tortured and crying out in his agony, I will confess. It was not until the sun was westward that a wagon drawn by a mild gray ox came to the edge of the grassy margin, and as the man who led it was leaning to gather up the round stones that lay heaped in readiness to be carried away, he detected some startling object in the grass. The aged man had fallen forward, and his dead clutch was on the garment of the other. It was not possible to separate them. Nay, it was better to put them into the wagon and carry them as they were into the great piazza, that notice might be given to the eight. 
As the wagon entered the frequented streets, there was a growing crowd escorting it with its strange burden. No one knew the bodies for a long while, for the aged face had fallen forward, half hiding the younger. But before they had been moved out of sight, they had been recognized. "'I know that old man,' Piero di Cosimo had testified. "'I painted his likeness once. He is the prisoner who clutched Malema on the steps of the Duomo.' "'He is perhaps the same old man who appeared at supper in my gardens,' said Bernardo Rucellai, one of the eight. "'I had forgotten him. I thought he had died in prison. But there is no knowing the truth now.' "'Who shall put his finger on the work of justice and say, "'It is there? Justice is like the kingdom of God. It is not without us as a fact. It is within us as a great yearning.' End of chapter 67。Chapter 68 of Romola。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Goldfarb. Romola by George Eliot. Chapter 68 Romola's Waking. Romola, in her boat, passed from dreaming into long, deep sleep, and then again from deep sleep into busy dreaming, till at last she felt herself stretching out her arms in the court of the Bargello, where the flickering flames of the taper seemed to get stronger and stronger, till the dark scene was blotted out with light. Her eyes opened, and she saw it was the light of morning. Her boat was lying still in a little creek. On her right hand lay the speckless sapphire blue of the Mediterranean, on her left, one of those scenes which were, and still are, repeated again and again, like a sweet rhythm, on the shores of that loveliest sea. In a deep curve of the mountains lay a breadth of green land, curtained by gentle tree-shadowed slopes leaning towards the rocky heights. Up these slopes might be seen, here and there, gleaming between the treetops, a pathway, leading to a little irregular mass of building, that seemed to have clambered in a hasty way up the mountainside, and taken a difficult stand there for the sake of showing the tall belfry as a sight of beauty to the scattered and clustered houses of the village below. The rays of the newly risen sun fell obliquely on the westward horn of this crescent-shaped nook. All else lay in dewy shadow. No sound came across the stillness. The very waters seemed to have curved themselves there for rest. The delicious sun-rays fell on Romola, and thrilled her gently like a caress. She lay motionless, hardly watching the scene, rather, feeling simply the presence of peace and beauty. While we are still in our youth, there can always come, in our early waking, moments when mere passive existence is itself a leafy, when the exquisiteness of subtle, indefinite sensation creates a bliss which is without memory and without desire. As the soft warmth penetrated Romola's young limbs, as her eyes rested on this sequestered luxuriance, it seemed that the agitating past had glided away like that dark scene in the Bargello, and that the afternoon dreams of her girlhood had really come back to her. For a minute or two the oblivion was untroubled. She did not even think that she could rest here forever. She only felt that she rested. Then she became distinctly conscious that she was lying in the boat which had been bearing her over the waters all through the night. Instead of bringing her to death, it had been the gently lulling cradle of a new life, and in spite of her evening despair, she was glad that the morning had come to her again, glad to think that she was resting in the familiar sunlight rather than in the unknown regions of death. Could she not rest here? No sound from Florence would reach her. Already oblivion was troubled. From behind the golden haze were piercing domes and towers and walls, parted by a river and enclosed by the green hills. She rose from her reclining posture and sat up in the boat, willing, if she could, to resist the rush of thoughts that urged themselves along with the conjecture how far the boat had carried her. Why need she mind? This was a sheltered nook where there were simple villagers who would not harm her. For a little while at least she might rest and resolve on nothing. Presently she would go and get some bread and milk, and then she would nestle in the green quiet and feel that there was a pause in her life. She turned to watch the crescent-shaped valley, that she might get back the soothing sense of peace and beauty which she had felt in her first waking. She had not been in this attitude of contemplation more than a few minutes, when across the stillness there came a piercing cry, 
not a brief cry, but continuous, and more and more intense. Romola felt sure it was the cry of a little child in distress that no one came to help. She started up and put one foot on the side of the boat, ready to leap on to the beach. But she paused there and listened. The mother of the child must be near. The cry must soon cease. But it went on and drew Romola so irresistibly, seeming the more piteous to her for the sense of peace which had preceded it, that she jumped onto the beach and walked many paces before she knew what direction she would take. The cry, she thought, came from some rough garden growth many yards on her right hand where she saw a half-ruined hovel. She climbed over a low broken stone fence and made her way across patches of weedy green crops and ripe but neglected corn. The cry grew plainer, and convinced that she was right, she hastened towards the hovel. But even in that hurried walk she felt an oppressive change in the air as she left the sea behind. Was there some taint lurking among the green luxuriance that had seemed such an inviting shelter from the heat of the coming day? She could see the opening into the hovel now, and the cry was darting through her like a pain. The next moment her foot was within the doorway, but the sight she beheld in the sombre light arrested her with a shock of awe and horror. On the straw with which the floor was scattered lay three dead bodies, one of a tall man, one of a girl about eight years old, and one of a young woman whose long black hair was being clutched and pulled by a living child, the child that was sending forth the piercing cry. Romola's experience in the haunts of death and disease made thought and action prompt, she lifted the little living child, and in trying to soothe it on her bosom, still bent to look at the bodies and see if they were really dead. The strongly marked type of race in their features and their peculiar garb made her conjecture that they were Spanish or Portuguese Jews, who had perhaps been put ashore and abandoned there by rapacious sailors to whom their property remained as a prey. Such things were happening continually to Jews, compelled to abandon their homes by the Inquisition. The cruelty of greed thrust them from the sea, and the cruelty of superstition thrust them back to it. But, surely, thought Romola, I shall find some woman in the village whose mother's heart will not let her refuse to tend this helpless child, if the real mother is indeed dead. This doubt remained, because while the man and girl looked emaciated and also showed signs of having been long dead, the woman seemed to have been hardier and had not quite lost the robustness of her form. Romola, kneeling, was about to lay her hand on the heart, but as she lifted the piece of yellow woolen drapery that lay across the bosom, she saw the purple spots which marked the familiar pestilence. Then it struck her that if the villagers knew of this she might have more difficulty than she had expected in getting help from them. They would perhaps shrink from her with that child in her arms. But she had money to offer them, and they would not refuse to give her some goat's milk in exchange for it. She set out at once towards the village, her mind filled now with the effort to soothe the little dark creature, and with wondering how she should win some woman to be good to it. She could not help hoping a little in a certain awe she had observed herself to inspire, when she appeared, unknown and unexpected, in her religious dress. As she passed across a breadth of cultivated ground, she noticed, with wonder, that little patches of corn mingled with the other crops had been left to over-ripeness, untouched by the sickle, and that golden apples and dark figs lay rotting on the weedy earth. There were grassy spaces within sight, but no cow or sheep or goat. The stillness began to have something fearful in it to Romola. She hurried along towards the thickest cluster of houses, where there would be the most life to appeal to, on behalf of the helpless life she carried in her arms. But she had picked up two figs, and bit little pieces from the sweet pulp to still the child with. She entered between two lines of dwellings. It was time that villagers should have been stirring long ago, but not a soul was in sight. The air was becoming more and more oppressive, laden, it seemed, with some horrible impurity. There was a door open. She looked in and saw a grim emptiness. Another open door, and through that she saw a man lying dead with all his garments on, his head lying athwart a spade handle, and an earthenware cruise in his hand, as if he had fallen suddenly. Romola felt horror taking possession of her. Was she in a village of the unburied dead? She wanted to listen if there were any faint sound, but the child cried out afresh when she ceased to feed it, and the cry filled her ears. At last she saw a figure crawling slowly out of a house, and soon sinking back in a sitting posture against the wall. She hastened towards the figure. 
It was a young woman in fevered anguish, and she too held a pitcher in her hand. As Romola approached her, she did not start. The one need was too absorbing for any other idea to impress itself on her. "'Water! Get me water!' she said with a moaning utterance. Romola stooped to take the pitcher and said gently in her ear, "'You shall have water. Can you point towards the well?' The hand was lifted towards the more distant end of the little street, and Romola set off at once with as much speed as she could use, under the difficulty of carrying the pitcher as well as feeding the child. But the little one was getting more content as the morsels of sweet pulp were repeated, and ceased to distress her with its cry, so that she could give a less distracted attention to the objects around her. The well lay twenty yards or more beyond the end of the street, and as Romola was approaching it, her eyes were directed to the opposite green slope immediately below the church. High up on a patch of grass between the trees, she had descried a cow and a couple of goats, and she tried to trace a line of path that would lead her close to that cheering sight, when once she had done her errand to the well. Occupied in this way, she was not aware that she was very near the well, and that some one approaching it on the other side had fixed a pair of astonished eyes upon her. Romola certainly presented a sight which, at that moment and in that place, could hardly have been seen without some pausing and palpitation. With her gaze fixed intently on the distant slope, the long lines of her thick grey garment giving a gliding character to her rapid walk, her hair rolling backward and illuminated on the left side by the sun-rays, the little olive baby on her right arm now looking out with jet-black eyes, she might well startle that youth of fifteen, accustomed to swing the censer in the presence of a Madonna less fair and marvellous than this. She carries a pitcher in her hand to fetch water for the sick, it is the Holy Mother, come to take care of the people who have the pestilence. It was a sight of awe. She would perhaps be angry with those who fetched water for themselves only. The youth flung down his vessel in terror, and Romola, aware now of someone near her, saw the black and white figure fly as if for dear life towards the slope she had just been contemplating. But remembering the parched sufferer, she half filled her pitcher quickly and hastened back. Entering the house to look for a small cup, she saw salt meat and meal. There were no signs of want in the dwelling. With nimble movement she seated baby on the ground, and lifted a cup of water to the sufferer, who drank eagerly and then closed her eyes and leaned her head backward, seeming to give herself up to the sense of relief. Presently she opened her eyes, and looking at Romola said languidly, "'Who are you?' "'I came over the sea,' said Romola. "'I only came this morning.' Are all the people dead in these houses? I think they are all ill now, all that are not dead. My father and my sister lie dead upstairs, and there is no one to bury them, and soon I shall die. Not so, I hope, said Romola. I am come to take care of you. I am used to the pestilence. I am not afraid. But there must be some left who are not ill. I saw a youth running towards the mountain when I went to the well. I cannot tell. When the pestilence came, a great many people went away and drove off the cows and goats. Give me more water. Romola, suspecting that if she followed the direction of the youth's flight, she should find some men and women who were still healthy and able, determined to seek them out at once, that she might at least win them to take care of the child, and leave her free to come back and see how many living needed help, and how many dead needed burial. She trusted to her powers of persuasion to conquer the aid of the timorous, when once she knew what was to be done. Promising the sick woman to come back to her, she lifted the dark bantling again, and set off towards the slope. She felt no burden of choice on her now, no longing for death. She was thinking how she would go to the other sufferers, as she had gone to that fevered woman. But, with the child on her arm, it was not so easy to her as usual to walk up a slope, and it seemed a long while before the winding path took her near the cow and the goats. She was beginning herself to feel faint from heat, hunger, and thirst, and as she reached a double turning, she paused to consider whether she would not wait near the cow, which someone was likely to come and milk soon, rather than toil up to the church before she had taken any rest. Raising her eyes to measure the steep distance, she saw peeping between the boughs, not more than five yards off, a broad, round face, watching her attentively, and lower down the black skirt of a priest's garment, and a hand grasping a bucket. She stood mutely observing, and the face, too, remained motionless. 
Romola had often witnessed the overpowering force of dread in cases of pestilence, and she was cautious. Raising her voice in a tone of gentle pleading, she said, "'I came over the sea. I am hungry, and so is the child. Will you not give us some milk?' Romola had divined part of the truth, but she had not divined that preoccupation of the priest's mind which charged her words with a strange significance. Only a little while ago the young acolyte had brought word to the padre that he had seen the holy mother with the babe fetching water for the sick. She was as tall as the cypresses, and had a light about her head, and she looked up at the church. The Pievano, parish priest, had not listened with entire belief. He had been more than fifty years in the world without having any vision of the Madonna, and he thought the boy might have misinterpreted the unexpected appearance of a villager. But he had been made uneasy, and before venturing to come down and milk his cow, he had repeated many aves. The Pievano's conscience tormented him a little. He trembled at the pestilence, but he also trembled at the thought of the mild-faced mother, conscious that that invisible mercy might demand something more of him than prayers and hails. In this state of mind, unable to banish the image the boy had raised of the mother with the glory about her tending the sick, the Pievano had come down to milk his cow, and had suddenly caught sight of Romola pausing at the parted way. Her pleading words, with their strange refinement of tone and accent, instead of being explanatory, had a preternatural sound for him. Yet he did not quite believe he saw the Holy Mother. He was in a state of alarmed hesitation. If anything miraculous were happening, he felt there was no strong presumption that the miracle would be in his favour. He dared not run away. He dared not advance. "'Come down,' said Romola, after a pause. "'Do not fear. Fear rather to deny food to the hungry when they ask you.' A moment after the boughs were parted, and the complete figure of a thick-set priest with a broad, harmless face, his black frock much worn and soiled, stood, bucket in hand, looking at her timidly, and still keeping aloof as he took the path towards the cow in silence. Romola followed him and watched him without speaking again, as he seated himself against the tethered cow, and when he had nervously drawn some milk, gave it to her in a brass cup he carried with him in the bucket. As Romola put the cup to the lips of the eager child, and afterwards drank some milk herself, the padre observed her from his wooden stool with a timidity that changed its character a little. He recognized the Hebrew baby. He was certain that he had a substantial woman before him. But there was still something strange and unaccountable in Romola's presence in this spot, and the padre had a presentiment that things were going to change with him. Moreover, that Hebrew baby was terribly associated with the dread of pestilence. Nevertheless, when Romola smiled at the little one sucking its own milky lips and stretched out the brass cup again, saying, "'Give us more, good father,' he obeyed less nervously than before." Romola, on her side, was not unobservant, and when the second supply of milk had been drunk, she looked down at the round-headed man and said, with mild decision, "'And now tell me, father, how this pestilence came, and why you let your people die without the sacraments and lie unburied. For I am come over the sea to help those who are left alive, and you too will help them now.' He told her the story of the pestilence and while he was telling it the youth, who had fled before, had come, peeping and advancing gradually, till at last he stood and watched the scene from behind a neighbouring bush. Three families of Jews, twenty souls in all, had been put ashore many weeks ago, some of them already ill of the pestilence. The villagers, said the priest, had of course refused to give shelter to the miscreants, otherwise than in a distant hovel and under heaps of straw, but when the strangers had died of the plague, and some of the people had thrown the bodies into the sea, the sea had brought them back again in a great storm, and everybody was smitten with terror. A grave was dug, and the bodies were buried, but then the pestilence attacked the Christians, and the greater number of the villagers went away over the mountain, driving away their few cattle and carrying provisions. The priest had not fled, he had stayed and prayed for the people, and he had prevailed on the youth Jacopo to stay with him but he confessed that a mortal terror of the plague had taken hold of him, and he had not dared to go down into the valley. "'You will fear no longer, father,' said Romola, in a tone of encouraging authority. "'You will come down with me, and we will see who is living, and we will look for the dead to bury them. 
I have walked about for months where the pestilence was, and see, I am strong. Jacopo will come with us, she added, motioning to the peeping lad, who came slowly from behind his defensive bush, as if invisible threads were dragging him. Come, Jacopo, said Romola again, smiling at him. You will carry the child for me. See, your arms are strong, and I am tired. That was a dreadful proposal to Jacopo, and to the priest also, but they were both under a peculiar influence forcing them to obey. The suspicion that Romola was a supernatural form was dissipated, but their minds were filled instead with the more effective sense that she was a human being whom God had sent over the sea to command them. "'Now we will carry down the milk,' said Romola, "'and see if anyone wants it.' So they went all together down the slope, and that morning the sufferers saw help come to them in their despair. There were hardly more than a score alive in the whole valley, but all of these were comforted, most were saved, and the dead were buried. In this way days, weeks, and months passed, with Romola, till the men were digging and sewing again, till the women smiled at her as they carried their great vases on their heads to the well, and the Hebrew baby was a tottering, tumbling Christian, Benedetto by name, having been baptized in the church on the mountainside. But by that time she herself was suffering from the fatigue and languor that must come after a continuous strain on mind and body. She had taken for her dwelling one of the houses abandoned by their owners, standing a little aloof from the village street, and here on a thick heap of clean straw, a delicious bed for those who do not dream of down. She felt glad to lie still through most of the daylight hours, taken care of, along with the little Benedetto, by a woman whom the pestilence had widowed. Every day the padre and Jacopo and the small flock of surviving villagers paid their visit to this cottage to see the blessed lady, and to bring her of their best as an offering, honey, fresh cakes, eggs, and polenta. It was a sight they could none of them forget, a sight they all told of in their old age, how the sweet and sainted lady with her fair face, her golden hair, and her brown eyes that had a blessing in them, lay weary with her labours after she had been sent over the sea to help them in their extremity, and how the queer little black Benedetto used to crawl about the straw by her side and want everything that was brought to her, and she always gave him a bit of what she took and told them if they loved her they must be good to Benedetto. Many legends were afterwards told in that valley about the blessed lady who came over the sea, but they were legends by which all who heard might know that in times gone by a woman had done beautiful loving deeds there, rescuing those who were ready to perish. End of chapter 68「Chapter 69 of Romola. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Goldfarb. Chapter 69. Homeward. In those silent wintry hours when Romola lay resting from her weariness, her mind travelling back over the past and gazing across the undefined distance of the future, saw all objects from a new position— her experience since the moment of her waking in the boat had come to her with as strong an effect as that of the fresh seal on the dissolving wax. She had felt herself without bonds, without motive, sinking in mere egoistic complaining that life could bring her no content, feeling a right to say, I am tired of life, I want to die. That thought had sobbed within her as she fell asleep, but from the moment after her waking when the cry had drawn her she had not even reflected, as she used to do in Florence, that she was glad to live because she could lighten sorrow. She had simply lived. With so energetic an impulse to share the life around her, to answer the call of need and do the work which cried aloud to be done, that the reasons for living, enduring, laboring, never took the form of argument. The experience was like a new baptism to Romola. In Florence, the simpler relations of the human being to his fellow men had been complicated for her with all the special ties of marriage, the state, and religious discipleship, and when these had disappointed her trust, the shock seemed to have shaken her aloof from life and stunned her sympathy. But now, she said, it was mere baseness in me to desire death. If everything else is doubtful, this suffering that I can help is certain. If the glory of the cross is an illusion, the sorrow is only the truer. While the strength is in my arm, I will stretch it out to the fainting. 
while the light visits my eyes, they shall seek the forsaken. And then the past arose with a fresh appeal to her. Her work in this green valley was done, and the emotions that were disengaged from the people immediately around her rushed back into the old deep channels of use and affection. That rare possibility of self-contemplation which comes in any complete severance from our wanted life made her judge herself as she had never done before. The compunction which is inseparable from a sympathetic nature keenly alive to the possible experience of others began to stir in her with growing force. She questioned the justness of her own conclusions, of her own deeds. She had been rash, arrogant, always dissatisfied that others were not good enough, while she herself had not been true to what her soul had once recognized as the best. She began to condemn her flight. After all, it had been cowardly self-care. The grounds on which Savonarola had once taken her back were truer, deeper than the grounds she had had for her second flight. How could she feel the needs of others, and not feel above all the needs of the nearest? But then came reaction against such self-reproach. The memory of her life with Tito, of the conditions which made their real union impossible, while their external union imposed a set of false duties on her, which were essentially the concealment and sanctioning of what her mind revolted from, told her that flight had been her only resource. All minds, except such as are delivered from doubt by dullness of sensibility, must be subject to this recurring conflict, where the many twisted conditions of life have forbidden the fulfillment of a bond. For, in strictness, there is no replacing of relations. The presence of the new does not nullify the failure and breach of the old. Life has lost its perfection, it has been maimed, and until the wounds are quite scarred, conscience continually casts backward, doubting glances. Romola shrank with dread from the renewal of her proximity to Tito, and yet she was uneasy that she had put herself out of reach of knowing what was his fate, uneasy that the moment might yet come when he would be in misery and need her. There was still a thread of pain within her, testifying to those words of Fra Girolamo, that she could not cease to be a wife. Could anything utterly cease for her that had once mingled itself with the current of her heart's blood? Florence, and all her life there, had come back to her like hunger. Her feelings could not go wandering after the possible and the vague. Their living fibre was fed with the memory of familiar things and the thought that she had divided herself from them forever became more and more importunate in these hours that were unfilled with action. What if Fra Girolamo had been wrong? What if the life of Florence was a web of inconsistencies? Was she, then, something higher, that she should shake the dust from off her feet and say, This world is not good enough for me? If she had been really higher, she would not so easily have lost all her trust. Her indignant grief for her godfather had no longer complete possession of her, and her sense of debt to Savonarola was recovering predominance. Nothing that had come or was to come could do away with the fact that there had been a great inspiration in him which had waked a new life in her. Who, in all her experience, could demand the same gratitude from her as he? His errors, might they not bring calamities? She could not rest. She hardly knew whether it was her strength returning with the budding leaves that made her active again, or whether it was her eager longing to get nearer Florence. She did not imagine herself daring to enter Florence, but the desire to be near enough to learn what was happening there urged itself with a strength that excluded all other purposes. And one March morning the people in the valley were gathered together to see the Blessed Lady depart. Jacopo had fetched a mule for her and was going with her over the mountains. The padre, too, was going with her to the nearest town, that he might help her in learning the safest way by which she might get to Pistoia. Her store of trinkets and money, untouched in this valley, was abundant for her needs. If Romola had been less drawn by the longing that was taking her away, it would have been a hard moment for her when she walked along the village street for the last time, while the padre and Jacopo with the mule were awaiting her near the well, her steps were hindered by the wailing people, who knelt and kissed her hands, then clung to her skirts and kissed the grey folds, crying, Ah, why will you go, when the good season is beginning and the crops will be plentiful? Why will you go? Do not be sorry, said Romola. You are well now, and I shall remember you. I must go and see if my own people want me. Ah, yes, if they have the pestilence. Look at us again, Madonna. Yes, yes, we will be good to the little Benedetto. 
At last Romola mounted her mule, but a vigorous screaming from Benedetto as he saw her turn from him in this new position was an excuse for all the people to follow her and insist that he must ride on the mule's neck to the foot of the slope. The parting must come at last, but as Romola turned continually before she passed out of sight, she saw the little flock lingering to catch the last waving of her hand. End of chapter 69Chapter 70 of Romola. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Goldfarb. Romola by George Eliot. Chapter 70 Meeting Again. On the 14th of April, Romola was once more within the walls of Florence. Unable to rest at Pistoia, where contradictory reports reached her about the trial by fire, she had gone on to Prato, and was beginning to think that she should be drawn on to Florence in spite of dread, when she encountered that monk of San Spirito who had been her godfather's confessor. From him she learned the full story of Savonarola's arrest and of her husband's death. This Augustinian monk had been in the stream of people who had followed the wagon with its awful burthen into the piazza, and he could tell her what was generally known in Florence— that Tito had escaped from an assaulting mob by leaping into the Arno, but had been murdered on the bank by an old man who had long had an enmity against him. But Romola understood the catastrophe as no one else did. Of Savonarola, the monk told her, in that tone of unfavourable prejudice which was usual in the black brethren, Frati Neri, towards the brother who showed white under his black, that he had confessed himself a deceiver of the people. Romola paused no longer. That evening she was in Florence, sitting in agitated silence under the exclamations of joy and wailing, mingled with exuberant narrative which were poured into her ears by Mona Brigida, who had backslided into false hair in Romola's absence, but now drew it off again and declared she would not mind being grey if her dear child would stay with her. Romola was too deeply moved by the main events which she had known before coming to Florence to be wrought upon by the doubtful gossiping details added in Brigida's narrative the tragedy of her husband's death, of Fra Girolamo's confession of duplicity under the coercion of torture, left her hardly any power of apprehending minor circumstances. All the mental activity she could exert under that load of awe-stricken grief was absorbed by two purposes which must supersede every other, to try and see Savonarola, and to learn what had become of Tessa and the children. "'Tell me, cousin,' she said abruptly when Mona Brigida's tongue had run quite away from troubles into projects of Romola's living with her, has anything been seen or said since Tito's death of a young woman with two little children? Brigida started, rounded her eyes, and lifted up her hands. Cristo, no! What, was he so bad as that, my poor child? Ah, then, that was why you went away, and left me word only that you went of your own free will. Well, well, if I'd known that, I shouldn't have thought you so strange and flighty, for I did say to myself, though I didn't tell anybody else, what was she to go away from her husband for, leaving him to mischief, only because they cut poor Bernardo's head off? She's got her father's temper, I said. That's what it is. Well, well, never scold me, child. Bardo was fierce. You can't deny it. But if you had only told me the truth, that there was a young hussy and children, I should have understood it all. Anything seen or said of her? No, and the less the better. They say enough of ill about him without that. But since that was the reason you went— No, dear cousin, said Romola, interrupting her earnestly, pray do not talk so. I wish above all things to find that young woman and her children, and to take care of them. They're quite helpless. Say nothing against it. That is the thing I shall do, first of all. Well, said Mona Brigida, shrugging her shoulders and lowering her voice with an air of puzzled discomfiture, if that's being a pignone, I've been taking peas for paternosters. Why, Fra Girolamo said, as good as that widows ought not to marry again. Step in at the door, and it's a sin and a shame, it seems, but come down the chimney, and you're welcome. Two children, Santidio. Cousin, the poor thing has done no conscious wrong. She is ignorant of everything. I will tell you, but not now. Early the next morning, Romola's steps were directed to the house beyond San Ambrogio, where she had once found Tessa. But it was as she had feared. Tessa was gone. 
Romola conjectured that Tito had sent her away beforehand to some spot where he had intended to join her, for she did not believe that he would willingly part with those children. It was a painful conjecture, because if Tessa were out of Florence, there was hardly a chance of finding her, and Romola pictured the childish creature waiting and waiting at some wayside spot in wondering, helpless misery. Those who lived near could tell her nothing, except that old deaf Lisa had gone away a week ago with her goods, but no one knew where Tessa had gone. Romola saw no further active search open to her, for she had no knowledge that could serve as a starting point for inquiry, and not only her innate reserve, but a more noble sensitiveness made her shrink from assuming an attitude of generosity in the eyes of others by publishing Tessa's relation to Tito, along with her own desire to find her. Many days passed in anxious inaction. Even under strong solicitation from other thoughts, Romola found her heart palpitating if she caught sight of a pair of round brown legs, or of a short woman in the contadina dress. She never for a moment told herself that it was heroism or exalted charity in her to seek these beings. She needed something that she was bound specially to care for. She yearned to clasp the children and to make them love her. This at least would be some sweet result, for others as well as herself, from all her past sorrow. It appeared there was much property of Tito's to which she had a claim, but she distrusted the cleanness of that money, and she had determined to make it all over to the state, except so much as was equal to the price of her father's library. This would be enough for the modest support of Tessa and the children. But Mona Brigida threw such planning into the background by clamorously insisting that Romola must live with her and never forsake her till she had seen her safe in paradise. Else why had she persuaded her to turn Pionione? And if Romola wanted to rear other people's children, she, Mona Brigida, must rear them too. Only they must be found first. Romola felt the full force of that innuendo. But strong feeling unsatisfied is never without its superstition, either of hope or despair. Romola's was the superstition of hope. Somehow she was to find that mother and the children. And at last another direction for active inquiry suggested itself. She learned that Tito had provided horses and mules to await him in San Gallo. He was, therefore, going to leave Florence by the gate of San Gallo, and she determined, though without much confidence in the issue, to try and ascertain from the gatekeepers if they had observed any one corresponding to the description of Tessa with her children, to have passed the gates before the morning of the ninth of April. Walking along the Via San Gallo and looking watchfully about her through her long widow's veil, lest she should miss any object that might aid her, she descried Brati, chaffering with a customer. That roaming man, she thought, might aid her. She would not mind talking of Tessa to him. But as she put aside her veil and crossed the street towards him, she saw something hanging from the corner of his basket which made her heart leap with a much stronger hope. Brati, my friend, she said abruptly, where did you get that necklace? "'Your servant, Madonna,' said Brati, looking round at her very deliberately, his mind not being subject to surprise. "'It's a necklace worth money, but I shall get little by it, for my heart's too tender for a trader's. I have promised to keep it in pledge.' "'Pray tell me where you got it. From a little woman named Tessa, is it not true?' "'Ah, if you know her,' said Brati, "'and would redeem it of me at a small profit "'and give it her again, you'd be doing a charity, "'for she cried at parting with it. "'You'd have thought she was running into a brook. "'It's a small profit I'll charge you. "'You shall have it for a florin, "'for I don't like to be hard-hearted.' "'Where is she?' said Romola, "'giving him the money "'and unclasping the necklace from the basket "'in joyful agitation. "'Outside the gate there, at the other end of the Borgo, "'at old Sibylla Manetti's, "'Anybody will tell you which is the house.' Romola went along with winged feet, blessing that incident of the carnival which had made her learn by heart the appearance of this necklace. Soon she was at the house she sought. The young woman and the children were in the inner room, were to have been fetched away a fortnight ago and more, had no money, only their clothes, to pay a poor widow with for their food and lodging. But since Madonna knew them, Romola waited to hear no more but opened the door. Tessa was seated on the low bed. Her crying had passed into tearless sobs, and she was looking with sad, blank eyes at the two children, who were playing in an opposite corner, Lilo covering his head with his skirt and roaring at Nina to frighten her, then peeping out again to see how she bore it. The door was a little behind Tessa, and she did not turn round when it opened, thinking it was only the old woman. Expectation was no longer alive. Romola had thrown aside her veil and paused a moment, holding the necklace in sight. 
Then she said in that pure voice that used to cheer her father, Tessa! Tessa started to her feet and looked round. See, said Romola, clasping the beads on Tessa's neck, God has sent me to you again. The poor thing screamed and sobbed and clung to the arms that fastened the necklace. She could not speak. The two children came from their corner, laid hold of their mother's skirts, and looked up with wide eyes at Romola. That day they all went home to Mona Brigida's in the Borgo degli Abizzi. Romola had made known to Tessa by gentle degrees that Naldo could never come to her again, not because he was cruel, but because he was dead. "'But be comforted, my Tessa,' said Romola. "'I am come to take care of you always, and we have got Lillo and Nina.' Mona Brigida's mouth twitched in the struggle between her awe of Romola and the desire to speak unseasonably. "'Let be for the present,' she thought. "'But it seems to me a thousand years till I tell this little contadina, "'who seems not to know how many fingers she's got on her hand, who Romola is. "'And I will tell her some day, else she'll never know her place. "'It's all very well for Romola. "'Nobody will call their souls their own when she's by. "'But if I'm to have this puss-faced minx living in my house, "'she must be humble to me.' However, Mona Brigida wanted to give the children too many sweets for their supper, and confessed to Romola, the last thing before going to bed, that it would be a shame not to take care of such cherubs. "'But you must give up to me a little, Romola, about their eating and those things, for you have never had a baby, and I had twins, only they died as soon as they were born.'" End of chapter 70《Chapter Seventy One of Romola by George Eliot. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Goldfarb. Romola by George Eliot. Chapter Seventy One The Confession. When Romola brought home Tessa and the children, April was already near its close, and the other great anxiety on her mind had been wrought to its highest pitch by the publication in print of Fra Girolamo's trial, or rather of the confessions drawn from him by the sixteen Florentine citizens commissioned to interrogate him. The appearance of this document, issued by order of the Signoria, had called forth such strong expressions of public suspicion and discontent that severe measures were immediately taken for recalling it. Of course, there were copies accidentally mislaid, and a second edition, not by order of the Signoria, was soon in the hands of eager readers. Romola, who began to despair of ever speaking with Fra Girolamo, read this evidence again and again, desiring to judge it by some clearer light than the contradictory impressions that were taking the form of assertions in the mouths of both partisans and enemies. In the more devout followers of Savonarola, his want of constancy under torture and his retraction of prophetic claims had produced a consternation too profound to be at once displaced, as it ultimately was, by the suspicion, which soon grew into a positive datum, that any reported words of his which were an inexplicable contradiction to their faith in him had not come from the lips of the prophet, but from the falsifying pen of Ser Ciccone, that notary of evil repute, who had made the digest of the examination but there were obvious facts that at once threw discredit on the printed document. Was not the list of sixteen examiners half made up of the prophet's bitterest enemies? Was not the notorious Dolfo Spini, one of the new eight, prematurely elected, in order to load the dice against a man whose ruin had been determined on by the party in power? It was but a murder with slow formalities that was being transacted in the old palace. The Signoria had resolved to drive a good bargain with the Pope and the Duke of Milan by extinguishing the man who was as great a molestation to vicious citizens and greedy foreign tyrants as to a corrupt clergy. The frate had been doomed beforehand, and the only question that was pretended to exist now was whether the Republic, in return for a permission to lay a tax on ecclesiastical property, should deliver him alive into the hands of the Pope, or whether the Pope should further concede to the Republic what its dignity demanded, the privilege of hanging and burning its own profit on its own piazza. Who, under such circumstances, would give full credit to this so-called confession? If the frate had denied his prophetic gift, the denial had only been wrenched from him by the agony of torture, 
agony that in his sensitive frame must quickly produce raving. What if these wicked examiners declared that he had only had the torture of the rope and pulley thrice, and only on one day, and that his confessions had been made when he was under no bodily coercion? Was that to be believed? He had been tortured much more. He had been tortured in proportion to the distress his confessions had created in the hearts of those who loved him. Other friends of Savonarola, who were less ardent partisans, did not doubt the substantial genuineness of the confession, however it might have been coloured by the transpositions and additions of the notary, but they argued indignantly that there was nothing which could warrant a condemnation to death or even to grave punishment. It must be clear to all impartial men that if this examination represented the only evidence against the frate, he would die not for any crime, but because he had made himself inconvenient to the Pope, to the rapacious Italian states that wanted to dismember their Tuscan neighbor, and to those unworthy citizens who sought to gratify their private ambition in opposition to the common weal. Not a shadow of political crime had been proved against him. Not one stain had been detected on his private conduct. His fellow monks, including one who had formerly been his secretary for several years, and who, with more than the average culture of his companions, had a disposition to criticize Fra Girolamo's rule as prior, bore testimony, even after the shock of his retraction, to an unimpeachable purity and consistency in his life which had commanded their unsuspecting veneration. The Pope himself had not been able to raise a charge of heresy against the frate, except on the ground of disobedience to a mandate and disregard of the sentence of excommunication. It was difficult to justify that breach of discipline by argument, but there was a moral insurgence in the minds of grave men against the court of Rome, which tended to confound the theoretic distinction between the church and churchmen, and to lighten the scandal of disobedience. Men of ordinary morality and public spirit felt that the triumph of the frate's enemies was really the triumph of gross license, and keen Florentines like Soderini and Piero Guicciardini may well have had an angry smile on their lips at a severity which dispensed with all law in order to hang and burn a man in whom the seductions of a public career had warped the strictness of his veracity may well have remarked that if the frate had mixed a much deeper fraud, with a zeal and ability less inconvenient to high personages, the fraud would have been regarded as an excellent oil for ecclesiastical and political wheels. Nevertheless, such shrewd men were forced to admit that, however poor a figure the Florentine government made in its clumsy pretense of a judicial warrant for what had in fact been predetermined as an act of policy, the measures of the Pope against Savonarola were necessary measures of self-defense. Not to try and rid himself of a man who wanted to stir up the powers of Europe to summon a general council and depose him would have been adding ineptitude to iniquity. There was no denying that towards Alexander the Sixth, Savonarola was a rebel, and, what was much more, a dangerous rebel. Florence had heard him say, and had well understood what he meant, that he would not obey the devil. It was inevitably a life-and-death struggle between the frate and the pope, but it was less inevitable that Florence should make itself the pope's executioner. Romola's ears were filled in this way with the suggestions of a faith still ardent under its wounds, and the suggestions of worldly discernment, judging things according to a very moderate standard of what is possible to human nature. She could be satisfied with neither. She brought to her long meditations over that printed document many painful observations, registered more or less consciously through the years of her discipleship, which whispered a presentiment that Savonarola's retraction of his prophetic claims was not merely a spasmodic effort to escape from torture. But, on the other hand, her soul cried out for some explanation of his lapses, which would make it still possible for her to believe that the main striving of his life had been pure and grand. The recent memory of the selfish discontent which had come over her like a blighting wind, along with the loss of her trust in the men who had been for her an incarnation of the highest motives, had produced a reaction which is known to many as a sort of faith that has sprung up to them out of the very depths of their despair. It was impossible, she said now, that the negative, disbelieving thoughts which had made her soul arid of all good could be founded in the truth of things. Impossible that it had not been a living spirit and no hollow pretense, which had once breathed in the frate's words and kindled a new life in her. Whatever falsehood there had been in him had been a fall and not a purpose, a gradual entanglement in which he struggled, not a contrivance encouraged by success.' 
Looking at the printed confessions, she saw many sentences which bore the stamp of bungling fabrication. They had that emphasis and repetition in self-accusation, which none but very low hypocrites use to their fellow men. But the fact that these sentences were in striking opposition, not only to the character of Savonarola, but also to the general tone of the confessions, strengthened the impression that the rest of the text represented in the main what had really fallen from his lips. Hardly a word was dishonorable to him, except what turned on his prophetic enunciations. He was unvarying in his statements of the ends he had pursued for Florence, the Church, and the world, and apart from the mixture of falsity in that claim to special inspiration by which he sought to gain hold of men's minds, there was no admission of having used unworthy means. Even in this confession, and without expurgation of the notary's malign phrases, Fra Girolamo shone forth as a man who had sought his own glory indeed, but sought it by laboring for the very highest end, the moral welfare of men, not by vague exhortations, but by striving to turn beliefs into energies that would work in all the details of life. Everything that I have done, said one memorable passage, which may perhaps have had its erasures and interpolations, I have done with the design of being for ever famous in the present and in future ages, and that I might win credit in Florence, and that nothing of great import should be done without my sanction. And when I had thus established my position in Florence, I had it in my mind to do great things in Italy and beyond Italy, by means of those chief personages with whom I had contracted friendship and consulted on high matters, such as this of the General Council. And in proportion as my first efforts succeeded, I should have adopted further measures. Above all, when the General Council had once been brought about, I intended to rouse the princes of Christendom, and especially those beyond the borders of Italy, to subdue the infidels. It was not much in my thoughts to get myself made a cardinal or pope, for when I should have achieved the work I had in view, I should, without being pope, have been the first man in the world in the authority I should have possessed and the reverence that would have been paid me. If I had been made Pope, I would not have refused the office, but it seemed to me that to be the head of that work was a greater thing than to be Pope, because a man without virtue may be Pope, but such a work as I contemplated demanded a man of excellent virtues. That blending of ambition with belief in the supremacy of goodness made no new tone to Romola, who had been used to hear it in the voice that rang through the Duomo. It was the habit of Savonarola's mind to conceive great things, and to feel that he was the man to do them. Iniquity should be brought low, the cause of justice, purity, and love should triumph, and it should triumph by his voice, by his work, by his blood. In moments of ecstatic contemplation, doubtless, the sense of self melted in the sense of the unspeakable, and in that part of his experience lay the elements of genuine self-abasement. But in the presence of his fellow men for whom he was to act, preeminence seemed a necessary condition of his life. And perhaps this confession, even when it described a doubleness that was conscious and deliberate, really implied no more than that wavering of belief concerning his own impressions and motives, which most human beings who have not a stupid inflexibility of self-confidence must be liable to under a marked change of external conditions. In a life where the experience was so tumultuously mixed as it must have been in the Frates, what a possibility was opened for a change of self-judgment, when, instead of eyes that venerated and knees that knelt, instead of a great work on its way to accomplishment, and in its prosperity stamping the agent as a chosen instrument, there came the hooting and the spitting and the curses of the crowd, and then the hard faces of enemies made judges, and then the horrible torture, and with the torture the irrepressible cry, it is true what you would have me say. Let me go. Do not torture me again. Yes, yes, I am guilty. O oh God, thy stroke has reached me. As Romola thought of the anguish that must have followed the confession, whether in the subsequent solitude of the prison conscience retracted or confirmed the self-taxing words, that anguish seemed to be pressing on her own heart and urging the slow, bitter tears. Every vulgar, self-ignorant person in Florence was glibly pronouncing on this man's demerits, while he was knowing a depth of sorrow which can only be known to the soul that has loved and sought the most perfect thing, and beholds itself fallen. She had not then seen, what she saw afterwards, the evidence of the frate's mental state, after he had had thus to lay his mouth in the dust. As the days went by, the reports of new unpublished examinations, eliciting no change of confessions, ceased. 
Savonarola was left alone in his prison and allowed pen and ink for a while, that, if he liked, he might use his poor, bruised, and strained right arm to write with. He wrote, but what he wrote was no vindication of his innocence, no protest against the proceedings used towards him. It was a continued colloquy with that divine purity with which he sought complete reunion. It was the outpouring of self-abasement. It was one long cry for inward renovation. No lingering echoes of the old vehement self-assertion. Look at my work, for it is good, and those who set their faces against it are the children of the devil. The voice of sadness tells him, God placed thee in the midst of the people, even as if thou hadst been one of the excellent. In this way thou hast taught others, and hast failed to learn thyself. Thou hast cured others, and thou thyself hast been still diseased. Thy heart was lifted up at the beauty of thy own deeds, and through this thou hast lost thy wisdom and art, become and shalt be to all eternity nothing." After so many benefits with which God has honoured thee, thou art fallen into the depths of the sea, and after so many gifts bestowed on thee, thou, by thy pride and vainglory, hast scandalised all the world. And when hope speaks and argues that the divine love has not forsaken him, it says nothing now of a great work to be done, but only says, Thou art not forsaken, else why is thy heart bowed in penitence? That too is a gift." There is no jot of worthy evidence that from the time of his imprisonment to the supreme moment Savonarola thought or spoke of himself as a martyr. The idea of martyrdom had been to him a passion dividing the dream of the future with the triumph of beholding his work achieved, and now, in place of both, had come a resignation which he called by no glorifying name. But therefore he may the more fitly be called a martyr by his fellow men to all time. For power rose against him, not because of his sins, but because of his greatness. Not because he sought to deceive the world, but because he sought to make it noble. And through that greatness of his he endured a double agony, not only the reviling and the torture and the death throe, but the agony of sinking from the vision of glorious achievement into that deep shadow where he could only say, I count as nothing, darkness encompasses me. Yet the light I saw was the true light. End of chapter 71。Chapter 72 of Romola。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Goldfarb. Romola by George Eliot. Chapter 72. The Last Silence. Romola had seemed to hear, as if they had been a cry, the words repeated to her by many lips, the words uttered by Savonarola when he took leave of those brethren of San Marco who had come to witness his signature of the confession. Pray for me, for God has withdrawn from me the spirit of prophecy. Those words had shaken her with new doubts as to the mode in which he looked back at the past in moments of complete self-possession, and the doubts were strengthened by more piteous things still which soon reached her ears. The 19th of May had come, and by that day's sunshine there had entered into Florence the two papal commissaries charged with the completion of Savonarola's trial. They entered amid the acclamations of the people, calling for the death of the frate, for now the popular cry was, It is the frate's deception that has brought on all our misfortunes. Let him be burned, and all things right will be done, and our evils will cease. The next day it is well certified that there was fresh and fresh torture of the shattered sensitive frame. And now, at the first sight of the horrible implements, Savonarola in convulsed agitation fell on his knees, and in brief, passionate words, retracted his confession— declared that he had spoken falsely in denying his prophetic gift, and that if he suffered, he would suffer for the truth. The things that I have spoken, I had them from God. But not the less the torture was laid upon him, and when he was under it he was asked why he had uttered those retracting words. Men were not demons in those days, and yet nothing but concessions of guilt were held a reason for release from torture. The answer came, I said it that I might seem good. 
tear me no more. I will tell you the truth. There were Florentine assessors at this new trial, and those words of twofold retraction had soon spread. They filled Romola with dismayed uncertainty. But, it flashed across her, there will come a moment when he may speak, when there is no dread hanging over him but the dread of falsehood, when they have brought him into the presence of death, when he is lifted above the people and looks on them for the last time. They cannot hinder him from speaking a last decisive word. I will be there. Three days after, on the 23rd of May, 1498, there was again a long, narrow platform stretching across the great piazza from the Palazzo Vecchio towards the Tete dei Pisani. But there was no grove of fuel as before. Instead of that, there was one great heap of fuel placed on the circular area, which made the termination of the long, narrow platform. And above this heap of fuel rose a gibbet with three halters on it, a gibbet which, having two arms, still looked so much like a cross as to make some beholders uncomfortable, though one arm had been truncated to avoid the resemblance. On the marble terrace of the palazzo were three tribunals, one near the door for the bishop, who was to perform the ceremony of degradation on Fra Girolamo and the two brethren who were to suffer as his followers and accomplices, another for the papal commissaries, who were to pronounce them heretics and schismatics and deliver them over to the secular arm, and a third close to Marzocco, at the corner of the terrace where the platform began, for the gonfaloniera and the eight who were to pronounce the sentence of death. Again the piazza was thronged with expectant faces. Again there was to be a great fire kindled. In the majority of the crowd that pressed around the gibbet, the expectation was that of ferocious hatred, or of mere hard curiosity to behold a barbarous sight. But there were still many spectators on the wide pavement, on the roofs, and at the windows, who, in the midst of their bitter grief and their own endurance of insult as hypocritical piagnoni, were not without a lingering hope, even at this eleventh hour, that God would interpose by some sign to manifest their beloved prophet as his servant. And there were yet more who looked forward with trembling eagerness, as Romola did, to that final moment when Savonarola might say, O oh people, I was innocent of deceit. Romola was at a window on the north side of the piazza, far away from the marble terrace where the tribunals stood, and near her, also looking on in painful doubt concerning the man who had won his early reverence, was a young Florentine of two-and-twenty named Jacopo Nardi, afterwards to deserve honour as one of the very few who, feeling Fra Girolamo's eminence, have written about him with the simple desire to be veracious. He had said to Romola, with respectful gentleness, when he saw the struggle in her between the shuddering horror of the scene and her yearning to witness what might happen in the last moment, "'Madonna, there is no need for you to look at these cruel things. I will tell you when he comes out of the palazzo. Trust to me, I know what you would see.' Romola covered her face, but the hootings that seemed to make the hideous scene still visible could not be shut out. At last her arm was touched, and she heard the words, He comes. She looked towards the palace, and could see Savonarola led out in his Dominican garb, could see him standing before the bishop, and being stripped of the black mantle, the white scapulary, and long white tunic, till he stood in a close woolen undertunic that told of no sacred office, no rank. He had been degraded and cut off from the church militant. The baser part of the multitude delight in degradations apart from any hatred. It is the satire they best understand. There was a fresh hoot of triumph as the three degraded brethren passed on to the tribunal of the papal commissaries, who were to pronounce them schismatics and heretics. Did not the prophet look like a schismatic and heretic now? It is easy to believe in the damnable state of a man who stands stripped and degraded. Then the third tribunal was passed, that of the Florentine officials who were to pronounce sentence, and amongst whom, even at her distance, Romola could discern the odious figure of Dolfo Spini, endued in the grave black Luco as one of the eight. Then the three figures, in their close white raiment, trod their way along the platform amidst yells and grating tones of insult. "'Cover your eyes, Madonna,' said Jacopo Nardi. "'Fra Girolamo will be the last.' It was not long before she had to uncover them again. Savonarola was there. He was not far off her now. He had mounted the steps. She could see him look round on the multitude. 
but in the same moment expectation died and she only saw what he was seeing torches waving to kindle the fuel beneath his dead body faces glaring with a yet worse light she only heard what he was hearing gross jests taunts and curses the moment was past her face was covered again and she only knew that savonarola's voice had passed into eternal silence End of chapter 72epilogue to romola this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by david goldfarb romola by george eliot epilogue on the evening of the twenty-second of may fifteen o nine five persons of whose history we have known something were seated in a handsome upper room opening on to a loggia which at its right-hand corner looked all along the borgo pinti and over the city gate towards fiesole and the solemn heights beyond it at one end of the room was an archway opening into a narrow inner room hardly more than a recess where the light fell from above on a small altar covered with fair white linen over the altar was a picture discernible at the distance where the little party sat only as the small full-length portrait of a dominican brother for it was shaded from the light above by overhanging branches and wreaths of flowers and the fresh tapers below it were unlit but it seemed that the decoration of the altar and its recess was not complete for part of the floor was strewn with a confusion of flowers and green boughs and among them sat a delicate blue-eyed girl of thirteen tossing her long light brown hair out of her eyes as she made selections for the wreaths she was weaving or looked up at her mother's work in the same kind and told her how to do it with a little air of instruction for that mother was not very clever at weaving flowers or at any other work tessa's fingers had not become more adroit with the years only very much fatter she got on slowly and turned her head about a good deal and asked nina's opinion with much deference for tessa never ceased to be astonished at the wisdom of her children she still wore her contadina gown it was only broader than the old one and there was the silver pin in her rough curly brown hair and round her neck the memorable necklace with a red cord under it that ended mysteriously in her bosom her rounded face wore even a more perfect look of childish content than in her younger days Everybody was so good in the world, Tessa thought. Even Monobrigida never found fault with her now, and did little else than sleep, which was an amiable practice in everybody, and one that Tessa liked for herself. Monobrigida was asleep at this moment, in a straight-backed armchair a couple of yards off. Her hair, parting backward under her black hood, had that soft whiteness which is not like snow or anything else, but is simply the lovely whiteness of aged hair. Her chin had sunk on her bosom, and her hands rested on the elbow of her chair she had not been weaving flowers or doing anything else she had only been looking on as usual and as usual had fallen asleep the other two figures were seated farther off at the wide doorway that opened on to the loggia lillo sat on the ground with his back against the angle of the doorpost and his long legs stretched out while he held a large book open on his knee and occasionally made a dash with his hand at an inquisitive fly with an air of interest stronger than that excited by the finely printed copy of petrarch which he kept open at one place as if he were learning something by heart romola sat nearly opposite lillo but she was not observing him her hands were crossed on her lap and her eyes were fixed absently on the distant mountains she was evidently unconscious of anything around her an eager life had left its marks upon her the finely moulded cheek had sunk a little the golden crown was less massive but there was a placidity in romola's face which had never belonged to it in youth it is but once that we can know our worst sorrows and romola had known them while life was new absorbed in this way she was not at first aware that lillo had ceased to look at his book and was watching her with a slightly impatient air which meant that he wanted to talk to her, but was not quite sure whether she would like that entertainment just now. But persevering looks make themselves felt at last. Romola did presently turn away her eyes from the distance, and met Lillo's impatient dark gaze with a brighter and brighter smile. He shuffled along the floor, still keeping the book on his lap, till he got close to her and lodged his chin on her knee. "'What is it, Lillo?' 
said Romola, pulling his hair back from his brow. Lillo was a handsome lad, but his features were turning out to be more massive and less regular than his father's. The blood of the Tuscan peasant was in his veins. Mama, Romola, what am I to be? he said, well contented that there was a prospect of talking, till it would be too late to con Spirito Gentile any longer. What should you like to be, Lillo? You might be a scholar. My father was a scholar, you know, and taught me a great deal. That is the reason why I can teach you. Yes, said Lillo rather hesitatingly. But he is old and blind in the picture. Did he get a great deal of glory? Not much, Lillo. The world was not always very kind to him, and he saw meaner men than himself put into higher places because they could flatter and say what was false. And then his dear son thought it right to leave him and become a monk, and after that my father, being blind and lonely, felt unable to do the things that would have made his learning of greater use to men, so that he might still have lived in his works after he was in his grave. I should not like that sort of life, said Lillo. I should like to be something that would make me a great man, and very happy besides, something that would not hinder me from having a good deal of pleasure. That is not easy, my Lillo. It is only a poor sort of happiness that could ever come by caring very much about our own narrow pleasures. We can only have the highest happiness, such as goes along with being a great man, by having wide thoughts and much feeling for the rest of the world as well as ourselves. And this sort of happiness often brings so much pain with it that we can only tell it from pain by its being what we would choose before everything else because our souls see it is good. There are so many things wrong and difficult in the world that no man can be great. He can hardly keep himself from wickedness unless he gives up thinking much about pleasure or rewards and gets strength to endure what is hard and painful. My father had the greatness that belongs to integrity. He chose poverty and obscurity rather than falsehood. And there was Fra Girolamo. You know why I keep tomorrow sacred. He had the greatness which belongs to a life spent in struggling against powerful wrong and in trying to raise men to the highest deeds they are capable of. And so, my Lilo, if you mean to act nobly and seek to know the best things God has put within reach of men, you must learn to fix your mind on that end and not on what will happen to you because of it. And remember, if you were to choose something lower and make it the rule of your life to seek your own pleasure and escape from what is disagreeable, calamity might come just the same, and it would be calamity falling on a base mind, which is the one form of sorrow that has no balm in it, and that may well make a man say, it would have been better for me if I had never been born. I will tell you something, Lilo. Romola paused for a moment. She had taken Lilo's cheeks between her hands, and his young eyes were meeting hers. There was a man to whom I was very near, so that I could see a great deal of his life, who made almost every one fond of him, for he was young and clever and beautiful, and his manners to all were gentle and kind. I believe when I first knew him he never thought of anything cruel or base. But because he tried to slip away from everything that was unpleasant, and cared for nothing else so much as his own safety, he came at last to commit some of the basest deeds, such as make men infamous. He denied his father, and left him to misery. He betrayed every trust that was reposed in him, that he might keep himself safe and get rich and prosperous. Yet calamity overtook him. Again Romola paused. Her voice was unsteady, and Lillo was looking up at her with awed wonder. "'Another time, my Lillo. I will tell you another time. See, there are our old Piero di Cosimo and Nello, coming up the Borgo Pinti, bringing us their flowers. Let us go and wave our hands to them, that they may know we see them.' "'How queer old Piero is,' said Lillo, as they stood at the corner of the loggia, watching the advancing figures. He abuses you for dressing the altar, and thinking so much of Fra Girolamo, and yet he brings you the flowers. Never mind, said Romola. There are many good people who did not love Fra Girolamo. Perhaps I should never have learned to love him if he had not helped me when I was in great need.' 
End of Epilogue End of Romola by George Eliot